A century of foreign invasion. Political intrigue. And the reign of a devout and troubled king. Today, in a new episode of the History Chronicles, we will be discussing the last of the Anglo-Saxons. At the beginning of the 11th century, England sat in an uneasy position. To the east, across the cold expanse of the North Sea, lay the world of the Viking. From 1016 to 1035, England had been ruled by a Viking, the Danish King Canute. His reign was a product of two centuries of Viking influence in England, a presence that was particularly felt in the northeast of the country, the so-called Danelaw. Since the 8th century, the Vikings had raided the English coast from their homelands in modern-day Denmark, Norway and Sweden. In addition to stealing copious amounts of riches, many of these raiders also settled on England's shores, leaving a huge mark on England's culture, legal system and language. In 1013, the aptly named Swain Forkbeard had launched a massive invasion that had enabled him to take the English throne. Swain had died, however, shortly after this triumph, leading to an Anglo-Saxon uprising under the elderly Ethelred, who became King of England in 1014. Nevertheless, in 1015, Swain's son Canute was in a position strong enough to launch another sizeable invasion of England. Here he made himself king. Ethelred had died, leaving his son Edmund, the fledgling Anglo-Saxon monarch. Edmund had been wounded fighting the new Viking invaders under Canute, and he eventually made peace that allowed for Canute's swift succession to the throne. Canute's reign in England proved to be a period of lasting stability. He quickly executed his rivals among the Anglo-Saxon aristocracy and married Queen Emma, the widow of the deceased Ethelred. He was able to raise huge sums of money to pay for his military campaigns back in Denmark, where he faced significant opposition from the King of Norway. However, this stability did not last long. His son Harthacnut succeeded Canute after his death. But after Harthacnut being too long in Denmark, according to one chronicler, where he was dealing with rebellion, he was quickly replaced by his younger brother, Harold Harefoot. Harefoot, so called by monastic chroniclers because of his speed at travelling around the country, also did not last long as king. He died in 1040, paving the way for his sibling, Harthacnut, to finally stake his claim to the Kingdom of England. But Harthacnut had his own problems. Throughout his life, he had suffered from illness, thought to be tuberculosis. While attending the wedding of one of his followers in 1042, Harthacnut appears to have consumed a great amount of alcohol. Here, he suddenly fell to the ground in a seizure. And while this could well have been poison, it was perhaps more likely to have been a stroke, given his illness at the time. In any case, Harthacnut's death in 1042 provoked a new controversy. Who would be heir? Harthacnut had no official children to take his place. An agreement he had made with Magus the Good, the King of Norway, had secured the inheritance to the throne of Denmark. However, the English throne presented a new problem. So, where were the Anglo-Saxons in all of this? This is England that we have been talking about in this episode after all. We have seen them in a piecemeal fashion so far in the 11th century, causing problems for Canute and his successors when opportunities arose. But now, following the death of Harthacnut, Canute, the Anglo-Saxon royal line were to step in and play a more active role in England's future. In 1013, this royal line had fled England across the Channel to Normandy, where it had sought refuge in the face of the massive Danish invasion led by Swain Forkbeard. The family had a strong connection to the Norman duchy via a lady called Emma of Normandy, daughter of the Norman ruler Richard the Fearless. Emma had married the unpopular English king Ethelred in 1002, with whom she had had three sons, Edmund, Edward and Alfred. While Ethelred, the Anglo-Saxon who was to briefly become Swain's successor in 1015, returned to England with Edmund, his eldest son, Edward, remained in Normandy. It was this Edward that was to spend around 25 years living in Normandy, where he spent his childhood. Here he had a close relationship with the Norman Duke, Robert I, who had even planned a failed invasion of England in 1034, possibly to install the young Edward on the throne. Edward learned French, the language of the Normans, and even witnessed charters in the duchy. In these, he styled himself as the King of England, even as Danes ruled his homeland. 
So it was that the Anglo-Saxon royal line developed a strong connection with the Normans on the continent. Edward had returned to England in 1036, shortly after the death of King Canute. He had with him his brother Alfred, who, as a potential rival to Canute's son, was quickly captured by a man called Earl Godwin. An earl was the title given to the most powerful landholders in England, and of these, Godwin, the Earl of Wessex, was the richest and the most significant. In 1036, Godwin handed over Alfred to the king, Harold Harefoot, who proceeded to have Alfred blinded using two hot pokers shoved into his eyes. The story is brutal, but the purpose was simple. As a blinded man, Alfred would be no longer able to rule. He died shortly after. Tension was to remain between Edward and Godwin, the English earl who had facilitated his brother's cruel demise. In 1037, Emma and her son were expelled once more, again seeking refuge in Normandy. In 1041, however, events were to take a more promising turn for the young Edward. Harthur Canute, growing older and evidently more sickly, invited the prince back to England. Why the U-turn for the Danish king? As we have seen already, Harthur Canute had no heir in England, and here, at the recommendation of his chief earl, Godwin, a guaranteed heir in Edward was better than the chaos and instability that might otherwise result from the death of the king. And, as we shall see, Earl Godwin may well have believed that the young Edward could be easily swayed and influenced to his liking. In 1042, Harthur Canute died. Edward was acclaimed king and crowned in Winchester, the seat of the Anglo-Saxon treasury. Earl Godwin already showed his backing for the new king, gifting young Edward with a large ship. From the beginning, Edward demonstrated his support for the Godwin family in kind. He gave earldoms to Godwin's sons who were old enough to receive them. Swain was to be the Earl of Herefordshire, Harold the Earl of East Anglia. Godwin's nephew Bjorn even received lands in the East Midlands. The crowning connection, though, was in Edward's marriage to Godwin's daughter Edith, cementing the relationship between the powerful Earl of Wessex and the new royal dynasty. Surprisingly, Edward also acted against his own mother immediately after taking power. He seized her land and deprived her main adviser, Stigand, of his bishopric. It is difficult to see if this action was taken due to the influence of Earl Godwin, but it appears that the removal of Edward's only possible ally in England was likely to be beneficial to the Earl. In 1042, the Godwins dominated England. As Edward's reign developed, however, the power of England's leading family began to come into question. In 1046, Godwin's son Swain embarked on a military campaign in Wales that resulted in the dishonourable abduction of the abbess of Leominster. This lady, a lady called Iad Gifu, was held by Swain as long as it suited him, according to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Edward took Swain to task for this. He forced him to surrender his land and exiled him to Denmark, where, again, according to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, Swain ruined himself. In this instance, at least, it seemed Swain's father, Godwin, could or would do little to intervene on his son's behalf. Similarly, in 1047, Godwin's request for military help against King Magnus of Norway was rejected by King Edward. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle marked Godwin's attempted campaign as a foolish plan to everybody. It seemed as though the Godwins were seeking to act against any future Danish claims to the English throne. Swain, the son of Godwin, was to return from exile in 1049, and here he attempted to rally the rest of his family to his cause against the king. In this attempt, Swain again failed. The brief campaign against Edward lasted only long enough for Godwin's nephew Bjorn to be killed by the king's forces. As a consequence, Swain was again disgraced. He was declared nithing, the Anglo-Saxon word for outcast, and his lands were passed to Edward's French nephew, Ralph of Montez. Again, Edward seems to have had the final authority here. It was not long, however, before the entire Godwin family was to challenge Edward's power head-on. In 1051, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Yadziger, died. As was customary at the time, the king sought to exert his hand in the appointment of a new archbishop. He chose one of his long-term allies, a Frenchman called Robert of Jumiège. But Earl Godwin had a different idea. Godwin backed the candidate elected by the monks of Canterbury, a man called Ethelric, who just so happened to be one of Godwin's relatives. This friction worsened with the outbreak of a violent scuffle between Godwin's men and the forces of Edward's brother-in-law Eustace in the town of Dover. Edward ordered Godwin to discipline his men, but Godwin refused. Things got worse. 
Godwin, with his sons, was now summoned before the king. He did not turn up. Instead, he sailed for Flanders, lands on the continent where he too had allies. Godwin's eldest sons, Harold and Leofwine, fled to Ireland. Only Godwin's daughter, Queen Edith, was left at Edward's court. Despite the fact that she was Edward's wife, the king had her sent to a nunnery. Following Edith's departure, Edward now proceeded to fragment Godwin's power base in England. Godwin's lands in East Anglia and the southwest were given to Edward's supporters. The king himself took ownership of the Earldom of Wessex. Edward had now detached himself completely from the leading power brokers of English politics in the 11th century. But the Godwins were to make a comeback. The following year, 1052, saw Godwin's sons ravage Edward's newly held lands in Somerset and Devon. They met with their father on the Isle of Wight, on England's south coast, and proceeded with an army towards London. Here they confronted the king. He too had called out his third, the Anglo-Saxon army of the day. However, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle records that the men on Edward's side had no wish to fight their fellow brethren in Godwin's army over such a small issue. Without any fighting men to his cause, Edward was compelled to back down. Godwin and his sons were soon reinstated to their earldoms as the status of the kingdom was reset to one of Godwin domination. For the rest of Edward's reign, the king was to act merely as a puppet of the powerful Godwin family. Earl Godwin himself died in 1053, leaving his son Harold Godwinson as the heir to the family land and power as Earl of Wessex. As we'll see in the next episode, Harold was a proactive Earl who did much to preserve the stability of the kingdom with Edward at its head. Nevertheless, Edward's connections with Normandy and the Godwin lust for power set the scene for a momentous power struggle which was to come to a head in the year 1066. I will see you then, when we will discuss the events of one of the most important turning points in English history in the next episode of the History Chronicles. Thank you for watching today's episode of the History Chronicles. I hope you enjoyed it. Do not forget to like and subscribe and click that uh, notifications button as, button as well. Please do also check out our Patreon page and support us if you can. I'll see you next time. Thank you very much.